Hello, welcome back to Lab Hours. Thanks for stopping by. Today's mini lecture is going to be on conditional distributions and a little bit of notes on causation. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. We've got our Tommy triple for you today. We're going to talk about the denominators of conditional distributions and we're going to talk about the numerators of conditional distributions, okay? So let's just go ahead and jump right in. Uh, also, if you've missed the two previous distribution mini lectures, this one might be a little tough so because we're going to breeze through a couple things. This one's hopefully going to be a shorter one. Uh, but no less important than the rest of the ones that we're going to talk about. So this, let's talk about the denominator. But first of all, let's actually just talk about what the heck is a conditional distribution. Uh, if you remember from a bunch of lectures back, I'm going to actually scroll through this for you so that we can see it. You're going to recall we talked about the Bayes' theorem equation of conditional probability. And the one we're going to focus on is this one right here. The probability of A, if you've already told me B has happened, is the probability that A and B happen at the same time over the probability that A ha that B happened, right? So again, this is conditional probability. You'll recall this came from the conditional probabilities mini lecture, this Bayes' theorem equation. This is the first, this is one of the first things we talked about here on this channel in this little lab hours mini lecture series. So let's talk about this, right? We have the probability, this was back in the day when we were only looking at events that like either happened or they didn't, right? You remember this, where we were talking about either I throw my dart at the dartboard and I hit A or I don't hit A. But now we're in the world where these dartboards have levels, where they these variables A and B, uh, we've actually been using like K and A, for example. So the probability of K given A would be equal to the probability of K intersect A over the probability of A. But what does all of this actually mean? Well, you'll recall when we did that previous lecture on conditional probabilities, I talked about taking a dartboard, right? Taking our universal set dartboard, right? And it maybe looked like this, uh, something like that, who knows? And let me draw that with different colors to make it a little bit more obvious, right? Here's my blue, which is a little bit difficult to distinguish from the black, but that's okay, right? And let's call, we'll use our highlighters again, of course. This section over here on the left, we could call, you know, K. And this would have been K complement. And then over here, we'll highlight this section red up here up top, right? And we'll say, you know, up here, we'll call this A. And this was A complement, right? But this is going to be a little bit more complicated now that we've introduced the fact that K is not just yes or no, did K happen? Now we've got levels of K, right? So let's draw this, right? First, actually, let me give you the math, of course. That's what we always like to do here on the channel. Let's think, for example, back to this joint distribution from the previous, uh, from the previous mini lecture on uh, you know, joint and marginal probability distributions and stuff like that. What if I, the king or the queen of my island, were wandering around and I wanted to know if I know that a household I'm about to knock on has no kids in it. Like, I know that there aren't any kids, like I don't see any toys in the yard or something like that, right? What's the chance I'm gonna run into two adults? Okay, let's talk about this. Over here we have this distribution that is the universal set, right? Let's call this the universal set of my island. And we're just gonna leave that for a second. Let me give you the math first. Uh, in fact, I've already kind of given you the math here. We're gonna use this a lot, right? But here's what it looks like. The probability of A, right? I want to know, if I already know that there's no kids, that's my condition. The probability of A, given that I know K is equal to zero, right? If I know there aren't any kids in the household, how many adults should I prepare for, right? It's equal to the probability that A is equal to some value of A at the same time that K is equal to zero. And so what does that look like? Well, there's only two things A can be when K is zero, right? Let's narrow this down. K is only zero in two cases, right? When A is one or when A is two. That's the 20 and the 30, right? So how do I write this distribution? Well, first of all, I know it's gonna look like this. If A is equal to one, if A is equal to two. But do I just take raw this like 0.2 and 0.3 thing that I've got over here? Sorry, I got a little itch. Uh, the answer is no, because if I were to do this, then the trouble comes up. If I, true to, if, I, if I tried to draw this as a valid density, I'm sure you can already see what the problem is, but basically what would happen um, 
it would look like this kind of, you know, a equals 1, a equals 2, and what the heck happens over here on this left side, this other half, who knows? We have no idea what will go on. I'd throw a dart at this side of the board and be like, so what happens? And I'd be like, who knows? <laughs> How many adults lived in the house? Hmm, right? It's not going to be helpful. So these numbers aren't going to work if I take them just raw from the joint because I need to somehow scale this uh, to add up to some measure of 100%, some new 100%. And in fact, the reason that we're going to talk about the denominators first is I want to talk about this idea of a new 100%. Uh, this fraction, probability of k given a, is equal to the probability of k intersect a over the probability of a. This denominator right here, the probability of a, is the probability that the condition that you are given in the probability has happened already. Right, because that's the new universe that we're going to be looking at. So this probability of a, given that k is equal to 0, is operating only in the universe where k is equal to 0. So if I had a universal set that looked like this, and this is one that I've drawn several times, right? If I have some universe that looks like this, where the marginal distribution of k has k equals 0 on this half, k equals 1 on this half, and k equals 2 on that part, right? What this condition is doing is it's saying, OK, take this universal set where we've covered 100% of all of the um, houses on the island and narrow it down so that the new 100% is just this part of the dartboard where k is equal to 0. So let's do that. Over here, we have s sub k is equal to 0, right? This is the new 100% where k is equal to 0, and we have k equals 0 in the entire thing, right? Now, how do I know it's half of the board? Well, it's everywhere where my condition has happened, right? So my condition happens here and here, k equals 0, here and here. I just add those up. This isn't so much a marginal, a marginal distribution as it is just show me the places in the joint in everything that I've considered previously where this specific thing is true, right? And that's only true on this little half right here, right? So let's, you know, just like that. But then the question becomes like, still, how am I dividing this A, right? Would I put a line here? Would I put a line there? Would I put a line there? And in fact, you know, let's make these red. Would I put a line there? Would I put a line there? Would I put a line there? Question mark. That's covering everything we need to know about the denominator. The denominator is just the piece of the universal set that you are going to consider a new 100%. In this case, the denominator is going to be everywhere where a, where k is equal to 0, right? So this formula is going to look like this. Probability, if I wanted to take this thing from up here and turn it into this kind of format, it would look like this, right? The probability of a given that k is equal to 0, is equal to, let's take this and just shuffle it around a little bit. This is going to kind of be our money thing, so I'm going to move everything around it, right? The probability that a of a, given that k is equal to 0, is equal to the probability of a intersect k equals 0 over the probability that k equals 0. Right? And we've seen, what I've pulled out here, is we take the probability that k equals 0 and turn that into the new 100% from the conditional probability. So that's going to cover everything from the denominator. Hopefully that makes sense, right? We're only looking at the part of the board where the condition is true, and we're treating that as 100% because that is 100% of the outcomes where the condition is true. And that's what we're interested in, right? So that's going to cover the denominator. Let's talk about the let's talk about the numerator now. Let's take this, let's take these two pieces with us really quick. Over to talking about the numerator of a conditional distribution, right? It's just so that we can have these numbers up here in the top and we can have this formula, right? So we know from the previous part that this denominator is going to be equal to 0.5 in this case, right? That's what we got from here. K is 0 for exactly half of the households, so we're going to take half of the households make them the new universal set. But then the question is like, what do we do with this, this numerator thing? A intersect k equals 0. Well, the cool thing is this is actually going to turn into this little distribution right here. What we have to do 
is we have to take a look at what the probability of each individual value of a is, and then, you know, turn that into the conditional version of that probability. So in order to get this distribution, where we have a question mark if a is equal to 1 and a question mark of a if a is equal to 2, we just need to check the probability that a is equal to 1 and k is equal to 0, throw it over the denominator, and then do the same thing for a equals 2, because that's all of the possible outcomes where k is 0, right? k is 0 in these households up here, up top, and the only values of a that are present there are 1 and 2. So let's check for those individual probabilities and throw them in a distribution, right? Let's try that. What is the probability that a is equal to 1 and at the same time k is equal to 0? That's easy. It's given to us. It's 0.2. Easy peasy, right? 0.2. So then all we have to do in order to make this a good distribution, because you remember from the previous part that this distribution, if we just stole these numbers, was a bad distribution. It did not work. So let's put it over this condition that we're looking at now, this new 100% over this 0.5. Uh, 0.2 divided by 0.5 is the same thing as 0.2 times 2, which is equal to 0.4. Okay? What is the probability that a is equal to 2 at the same time that k is equal to 0, right? Um, well, that's pretty easy. We get this from the table. It's equal to 0.3, right? So we have this 0.3 right here. And then let's adjust it for the fact that we're only looking at the spot where k is equal to 0, right? Like a fraction is like 3 out of 7, right? Or, you know, something out of something. So I'm saying all of the households where there's 2 adults and 0 kids out of all of the households where there's 0 kids. Because in some of these, there's 1, and in some of these, there's 2, right? So this is how I'm getting this conditional distribution, right? So let's put this over the condition, the new 100%. And we'll get 0.6. Let's try rewriting this distribution that we had from last time. Okay, now that we have these two numbers, let's try this. Okay, probability of A, the distribution, given that we know there are no kids in the household, would be equal to, it's a piecewise function, of course, because we have several values, 0.4 and 0.6 if A is equal to 1, if A is equal to 2. Easy peasy, right? Super, super easy. This is the conditional distribution of A. If I know that k is equal to 0, if that's my condition, I take all of the places where that happens in the universal set, and I make it the new 100%. Then I just take each individual value of A when that condition is met and see what fraction of that new 100% is made up by this old intersection, right? If I were to draw this using this new thing that we've pulled up, um, you'll recall that this new universal set where k was equal to 0 was only equal to half of our original universal set. And our original universal set is where we got this 0.2 and 0.3. So if I were to draw the original set again, right, the original universal set looked like this where we had k equals 0. And in fact, let me make those blue really quick to keep it consistent. Boop. Doesn't really change much, I know, but keeps my mental good, right? And then over here we have k equals 1 and k equals 2. But now we're only interested in the part where k is equal to 0, right? Boom. The one thing that we knew about before was that 20% of the households made up 0, 1, and 30% 30 of, 30 of households made up 0, 2 for kids and adults, respectively. So we had 20%, right, over here. Uh, we could have had, you know, for example, k equals 0, a equals 1, k equals 0, a equals 2. And this would be like a division, right? And under this original division, we had 20% of the box here on this 0, 1. And we had 30% of the box, if you assume I'm drawn correctly, in this 0, 2. Well, now, if I get rid of it so I'm only looking at the red, 
right? This new 100% where k is equal to 0 is my new 100%. Well, the cool thing is like this, this point 2 in the old thing is now 40% of this new box, right? I've limited the box to only where the condition is true, this k equals 0. And now this part where a is equal to 1 is 40% of it. And this part is 60%, where a is equal to 2. And because k is constant across the whole condition, it doesn't need to show up in my distribution because I already know k is equal to 0, right? You told me k was equal to 0. That's the condition. So now it's only how do the variables that are not a part of the condition play into this, right? That's pretty much everything we need to cover for these uh, distributions, right? These conditional distributions. You can take this formula, break it down like this, for whatever condition I was able to give you. I could give you a equals 1 and you could find the probability of k. Or I could give you a equals 2 and you could find the probability of k, and so on and so forth. All it comes down to is narrowing down this universal set into a certain specific condition and then finding these fractions of what's left and and, and reporting that as a distribution. Now these numbers add up to 100% because in this condition, this a equals 1 and a equals 2 covers all of the possible options. There are no other options where k is equal to 0 and a is equal to something else. So this adds up, it's a valid function, and we're Gucci to go. So let's go ahead and cross that off of numerators for conditional distributions. This one is looking like it's going to be a nice short one. This causation caution is something that we have to talk about. It's a little bit unrelated, and it's just going to be a quick note. Uh, and all it's going to do is it's going to look like this. That's a bad line around, right? Correlation is not equal to causation. Uh, you'll notice with things like conditional probabilities and these conditional distributions that you can find conditional correlation if you wanted to. If you wanted to find like the expected value of a given that k is equal to 1, like you could do that or given that k is equal to 0, right? You could do that because now you have this distribution that you've made. And now that you have the distribution, you can just treat it as the distributions we've talked about in the previous mini lectures, right? You'd take every value of a that can show up, right? Once you've built this condition into your distribution, you don't have to worry about k anymore. It's super nice, right? So you could find a conditional expected value or a conditional variance and stuff like that. So what do we take away from all of this? In fact, let me just outline this really quickly for you. Expected value of a given that k is equal to 0, I'd take every value of a, 1 and 2. I would show the probabilities of seeing each of those, 0.2 and 0.6, add them together, because that's our little formula for expected value, of course. And that would give me, you know, 0.4 plus 1.2 is 1.6, right? And you'll notice from the previous lectures on like distributions and stuff that the expected value of A uh, was previously different from that, which is what we found in the correlation lecture, right? The expected value of A we found was 1.65, but now if you only limit it to the places where they don't have any kids, it's only 1.6. So this is slightly different, of course, because you have changed what the set looks like. That's what it comes down to. So when you make those changes and you say, oh, if I get rid of kids, I actually expect fewer adults on average, because this one's 1 1.6, but this one was 1.65. Does that mean that like having more kids like causes more adults to be in the household or having more adults in the household or fewer adults in the household causes there to be fewer kids? The answer is maybe. It could be true. That could be the case. And in fact, in economics, I like to say that economics is the most social of all the sciences and the most science of all the socials, which is to say in places like psychology, if you even try to insinuate causation, uh, sometimes it can be troublesome. Or in the College of Family Life, uh, I mean, we're in the College of Family, Home, and Social Sciences, but in the School of Family Life, where my wife graduated from, she told me one day that if you even try to insinuate correlation, that you like, you could get crucified for that. And I was like, that's pretty bold language. And she was like, that's true. 
right? And it may not be true all the time. Um, and then in other sciences like physics, like all, everything is causation, right? Like the Earth's gravity causes me to not be able to move. Like this is why. Econ is the place where these two things get fuzzy, where we see correlations and we want to parse out whether or not they are causations or not, right? Like, so you can see the stock market jump when Elon Musk's tweets uh, get blocked or like he tweets something crazy. But then the question is like, did Elon's tweet cause the stock market to move or did the stock market happen to move when he tweeted or was he tweeting in response to the stock market moving, right? There are methods that we will teach you in this class and future classes to sort of parse through these questions. But for now, just please recall that correlation by itself does not indicate causation. It could go one way, it could go the other way, it could be some other thing causing both of these things to move at the same time. We just don't know yet. So for now, uh, stay eager to learn, but don't be so eager to call things causal. Uh, and in the future, we will continue to give you tools in this class, in Econ 388, in Econ 398, which is Applied Econometrics, is actually all about this. Uh, so I'd encourage you to take those classes after you take this one. But that is going to wrap up everything for this mini lecture, luckily. Uh, we covered conditional distributions, their numerators and denominators. We covered a, a small caution on causation. And uh, that is going to be everything for today for today's mini. Hopefully it was wonderful for you. Stop by next time and we're going to talk about regression, which is one of those really nice things that is going to be a useful tool for trying to parse out causation in the future. Now, we're going to teach it to you in a fairly limited sense in this class, but in the future, like Econ 388, that is regression the class. So it's going to be a good prep one. It's going to be super fun. It's going to be super interesting, I think, uh, and it's super useful for the future. So uh, hopefully you'll stop by for that next mini lecture. Uh, we look forward to seeing you there. We, of course, I mean me. And of course, if you have any questions, if you're in the class, email tmorg.ta at gmail.com. And if you're not in the class, email labhours at tmorg.org. As always, I'm happy to answer any questions over email or uh, in the comments. If you want to leave a comment and don't want to email, it's 2022. Uh, if you like the video, like it. If you want to keep seeing these more and have them pop up, subscribe, hit the little notification bell. You know how it goes, hopefully. If not, that's fine. I'll just keep emailing you the playlist. Thanks for stopping in. Hope you have a wonderful day, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.